Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for his introduction, Jim. And uh, I'd like to say thanks to the Leopold Stream Keepers, the Sea to, Scot um, sea, sea to Stream Educators, are really how I got involved and why I'm here tonight. Because when I um, published my book, uh, uh, some of the people in that group invited me to Nanaimo. And uh, they uh, subsequently got invited here. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the support for the, for the talk and for, and for the um, uh, aquarium for facilitating. And uh, it's just a fantastic to be here. I've been here for a long time. And um, my, my talk tonight is kind of uh, mixed. It'll, it'll be sort of international and, and local. And bear with me as we go through. I'm trying to show some basic principles of estuaries, regardless of their size, whether they're little tiny ones like the ones down in Bain Sound, or whether they're big ones like the Fraser or the Campbell, uh, they all have certain basic principles. And that's why I wrote the book, because as I went through my career, I, I ran into people that said, well, you know, I'd like to work on an estuary. Where do I start? What do, how do I sample an estuary? I've worked in a stream, I've worked in the ocean, but I don't know how to work on an estuary. So I had to teach them or t you know, tutor them and so on. And so eventually I thought, well, I'm getting kind of fed up about this. I'm going to write a book about it. So that's what I did. And it covers um, a wide range of topics, uh, but it basically focuses on the adaptations, habitats, and conservations of salmonids. Um, now, what are salmonids? So we think of salmon, but there's a big family out there that's called Salmonidae, actually, it's a subfamily. And there's 18 species of them that live in the ocean as well as the fresh water. That is, they're anadromous. They go into the ocean and then they go back to fresh water to spawn. So that's what I say, Salmonis, that's what I mean. Uh, let's see, the next slide. Okay, so the outline of the talk, briefly I'll describe the book, which is the back there. Uh, an overview of the ecology of young Salmonids in estuaries, the types of estuaries around the world, the Campbell River estuary, as I knew it, in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, and describe a, a rather uh, unique experiment that we did in the Campbell, Curtis, with the great courtesy of Jim here at the hatchery. And then I spent quite a bit of time discussing the factors that affect the survival uh, of, the, of the salmon when, they, when they're in the estuary. Uh, it's, a con it's a complicated um, issue, but just bear with me. I'll try to explain it as I go through it. And we've certainly got a long way to go to understand completely, so I talk a bit about the conclusions and where, you know, if I was going to start my career again, where I go this time. Um, and as I go through the talk, you'll see I'm showing different spe species of fish here. Some of them which we don't ordinarily think of here in uh, Vancouver Island in Vancouver as being um, anadromous fish, like this one over on the left-hand side. It's a brook trout, which live in lakes in our region, but they're in the uh, um, east coast of North America. They're, they're anadromous. They go to the ocean. And they're very famous uh, brook trout there. Called, they call them salters. And then, of course, we have our coastal cutthroat trout, which uh, everybody knows about them. They're, they're uh, salmonid. So I'll be showing some of these different pictures as we go along. So in the, in the book, just to give you a very brief outline, um, there's different chapters, why I wrote it, what Salmonis to consider. The second, the third, the fourth chapters talk about the oceanography and the geology of an estuary. The fifth chapter talks about um, the kinds of Salmonis we have and some of the uh, invasive, invasive Salmonis around the world. The sixth chapter talks about sampling. Seven and eight and nine are behavior and growth and osmoregulation. Now, osmoregulation, as you probably know, is what the fish has to do when it moves into the ocean. Because when they, as we know, our, our blood has a certain salt content. And when the river, when the fish is in fresh water, it has to maintain a certain salt content. But then it moves to the ocean. There's a tendency for the salt to move into the body. So it has to go through a whole physiological change and start pumping out salt, or else it will die from, from uh, salt toxicity. So that's when I say osmoregulation, that, that's what I mean. 
and it's a very important thing which happens in the estuary in many species. Then I talk about food webs and how, how, what salmon eat in estuaries. Uh, chapter 12 and 13 is how to um, assess sur survival in an estuary, a big, a big issue because people are always asking, okay, well, we've restored our estuary, what does it mean in terms of survival in some islands? And uh, then um, chap another couple of chapters, 18 is a very important chapter for those of you who are interested in conservation and management because I describe the sort of basic tenets of an estuary management plan. As Jim described, Campbell River was one of the first uh, ones on the coast here, but there are certain common tendencies uh, or principles um, that people in invoke when they're talking about management, uh, protected areas, how to map an estuary and uh, restore an estuary. And, um, you know, the book is not a management type book, but I try to, try to prevent some principles there. And there's a huge amount of reference, a thousand references in it. There's a lot of work. <clears throat> and then there's a, there's a bunch of appendices which are um, on the internet, the UBC library, and they're, they're anybody can get at them without the book. And it's of all the data tables um, providing uh, that support the chapters because when I finished, I wrote the book, I ended up with 138,000 words. <laughs> the editor said, I'm sorry, you can only have 112,000 words or something. So I had to do something with all the other uh, words and numbers that I had written. So we came up with a, a compromise and put it on the internet, which was really a, a very great thing to do. And also it enabled color images of the book because it's too expensive to public color, uh, pub, uh, pub, publish color images in this UBC press. So on the internet, they come up. And then there's a, a primer for citizens, um, citizen scientists, for people who um, are just coming into a totally cold. Uh, you can, I describe estuaries and some audits in, in very basic terms. Yeah. And then there's more or references. Okay, so moving on, why should there be a worldwide interest in survival? Uh, well, in many parts of the world, the estuaries are thought to be only uh, transitory places where the fishes sort of swim through and nothing really happens to them in there. They sort of motor through, and that happens in, in many uh, estuaries. In many Atlantic salmon, for example, they go through in like a tidal cycle. And that happens with our, our pink salmon here, too. But they still have to have the estuary. They can't avoid it. And if the health, and if the estuary is polluted, for example, by dissolved oxygen, uh, low dissolved oxygen, the estuary is, is a blockage to them. And that's actually why estuaries first became important in, in Europe, in the Thames River, when because of the great sewage disposal problem, salmon couldn't get through the estuary. Um, and then, of course, as, as we know, the rate of environmental change is very, very quickly happening. Um, there's a lot of salmon that's uh, into non, I call non-natal estuaries, estu uh, you know, hatchery, ocean ranching. These are all issues that are important around the world. And just be before I get into the local scene, this is where the estuaries that I uh, touch on or describe in some detail in the book, and you can see they're all, the salmon are all over the place in the, in the temperate region. And you can see, as many people have described, it's the sort of 30 degree latitude across here, and it's a temperature related phenomenon. And just they're down here, we've got the same latitude now. And they're in New Zealand. They're even on a tiny island here in the southern part of the Indian Ocean. And they were, you know, they were introduced into New Zealand into the, uh, in the 1880s. Uh, 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 brown trout were moved there in the uh, eight, uh, 19th century. So they're really on, on the move. So getting into our the local um, salmon or salmon and life cycles, there's an important point that a lot of people don't uh, think about the fact that there are some species of salmon, 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 I'll call them salmon from now on, that spawn once. But there are others that spawn twice, or maybe even three times. And so you, a lot of the times you see these, these diagrams that show 
the Salmon and life cycle with the river and the estuary and the ocean down here. And what I'm showing here is that the red line uh, is indicating the salmon that are in only spawning once. There are sockeye, I think, chinook, chum, and, and they, they come around here and they go in the ocean. They come up here and they die. But then there's another kind, these green ones that come back here, and they may not, some of them survive and spawn again. And not all of them will, but some of them will, and they'll go back to the ocean, and those fish will survive, and they'll come back again. Um, so there's there's the two um, basic life lifestyles, and in our in our region, it's like the steelhead, gully garden char, cutthroat. Those those are the ones that we have locally that spawn more than once. But there's ten others that I describe in the book that do that. And so I, as I mentioned in the in the book, they made the more estuary dependent because they go up and down and up and down and up and down. And so there's, some, there's one, some species that live up to a maximum of 16 years. So if you count up and downs of those, that's 32 times. So that's why some are more dependent than others. Okay, so what kind of uh, estuaries do we have? Well, there's, you know, they're, they're, they all have a basic uh, landscape formed by the geology and fresh, fresh water, of course, they have to have fresh water. There has to be a sort of a hole in the landscape for the fresh water to flow through. So, that they, like on, this is the Baltic coast, they're very brackish, just like around Sweden and Denmark and, uh, and the Baltic, and then there's a Norwegian estuary, and there's a, um, a, a, a lagoon in Russia. This is in like, um, Russian Far East with kind of a bar built lagoon, which we have in, in some areas. And this is the Hamathko River Estuary, as you probably know, it's up at the head of, uh, head of Butte Inlet. And it's one of the more uh, classic kind of muddy, marshy kind of estuary that we, that we think of, with a sort of gradation here from the forest down to uh, mud flats and then marsh and then onto the sand flats. And this is kind of an interesting picture because it shows it's the uh, it's the east side of the delta, but it shows how the, how the main river is, is breaking through the forest uh, because of a freshet or a flood. And this is what another aspect of, of estuaries is that they're always very dynamic. They're sort of building and um, destroying themselves as time goes through geology in geological time. And then we have the whole, uh, uh, um, coming to the Campbell Estuary, in comparison to some of the major estuaries around, around the world. I just put this slide on, because there's restoration is, is, is happening in many places in the world. And this the top one is in, in Rotterdam, and it's, uh, of course, a huge Rhine Muse Estuary. But they're trying to restore water, water quality there for Atlantic salmon and sea trout. That's the, the major salmon and species they have in that part of Europe. And of course those canals, as uh, those of you have been there, they know they're, they're terribly polluted, there's water, water flow problems, the watersheds are, are pretty well messed up with uh, agricultural activities. Uh, but there, there's efforts underway to restore them. Uh, as Jim pointed out, when I uh, came on, on the scene in the uh, early 80s, um, I call that back in the day, but it really wasn't. Um, log storage was, was a major issue. People were saying, well, we're, we're parking log booms in the estuaries, and this is not a good idea uh, because they're, you know, they're landing on the, on the mud, they're destroying the vegetation, which is the, the basis of the food web. Uh, they're making bark is, is decomposing and causing low dissolved oxygen. And so, and this picture here shows the estuary as it was in 1945, which is 20 years before, I, well, 40 years before I came on the scene. But it really wasn't that much different, I don't think, with the gym in the 80s. Um, and so, 
through the uh, collaboration of our habitat managers, a fellow by the name of Mike Brownlee and a man by the name of Ted Matthijs, who lived here in the Campbell River, he worked for DC Forest Products, and uh, people like Jim, they came up with a plan to try and, and resolve this. And um, so that's, um, I'll be touching on that, but it's not really the focus of the talk, the restoration. Before getting into the uh, description of what we did do at the Campbell, I uh, just show the basic geography, and I can talk about the restoration here, with the river and Banky Slough over here. And here's the created islands that we're, we're, we built in the uh, in the 80s, 80, 82, 83, I think it was. <coughs> and, um, the log sort was up was built up here and all the booms were taken away. And these islands were built with gravel from the construction of the of the sort. So I just I'm not gonna go into any detail on that, it's a whole new story, but that's <coughs> uh, what I do want to point out is the, the river, the, what I call the middle estuary, the lower estuary, and then because it's not joining on here, I want to talk discovery passage. Uh, which, which is I call the outer reaches or, or the coastal, the coastal um, part of, of the system, and so we did um, sampling out here on Discovery Passage, and that's an in the Anchor Inn, and you can see it's a very different kind of landscape with kelp beds, high salinity, uh, sort of rocky, gravelly shore, and uh, it's just it's, it's not an estuary, right? So we were trying to compare the survival of the fish that had an estuary and those that didn't. So how did we do that? Which I will now describe. describe. But before I do that, um, I want to re revert back to the um, pictures of the estuary. Just take note that this is a channel. So the river is coming through here. And it's important to note that the, the channel changes depth with the tide and with the river flow. And here I'm showing, in this picture, just showing some different kinds of estuaries. Campbell River is sort of like a delta. It's a delta estuary. But the important point I'm trying to point out here is the in the estuary, we have a very stratified situation with the salt is on the top. Salt floats, right? So a basic aspect of an estuary is that salt floats and fresh water is, uh, sorry, fresh water flows and salt is sinking on, on the bottom. So we have here what's called the salt wedge with the tide pushing in the water from Discovery Passage. On a high tide, uh, it's coming up, up the channel. And this, this is just showing different layers of, of salinity with the river coming here. And when this changes, even from day from time to time, because when the river is low and the tide is medium, it's not it's not so stratified. Things are more mixed up. And just keep that in mind because I'll point out later on how this can bring in food from, from Discovery Passage. Okay, so just another couple of diagrams where we look at the distribution of solidity, just showing the different uh, layers. This is Discovery Passage here for the it's very salty, about 30 parts per thousand. The river is very brackish. It's down here, close to zero. The middle and uh, outer estuary are sort of halfway in between. So as I was discussing later, this is where the fish are trend they're changing from fresh water to salt water through this, in this very brackish condition where they change their pumping of, their, of the salt in their cells. This one here is a little bit more difficult to explain, but it's showing here along here, this is in months, and this is the catches of, of the 
of the salmon. And what it's showing is here, the middle estuary has a peak. That's, that slide is not quite showing. But this is a, a span through the summer here. And basically it's showing there's a peak of Chinook Fry here, a peak of Chinook Fry there, and a peak of Chinook Fry here in the outer part. And this is about, this is about 60 days. But take in mind, this is before the days when we could put tags, electronic tags on these fish and find out how long they lived in the estuary. This is really the only way we could do it at that time, is by tracking the uh, abundance of them in different parts of the estuary uh, without killing them and looking for coated wire tags and things like that. So it's, it was just a very basic um, method of trying to estimate how long they lived in the estuary. We, not, that was not known at that time, in the 80s. So, we know that the fish are in the estuary. We know they live there for about 60 days. We know that they're going through osmond regulatory change. Okay, so, so what? Well, what we did was I call it the, uh, how do they measure the survival of these things if they're in the estuary? And everybody was asking that question. And what we did is I call it the sledgehammer approach because it's a very uh, basic kind of experiment where we had um, coated wire tags from the hatchery, from courtesy of uh, Jim and others at the hatchery. We reared them to a size that sort of simulated a wild fish, and they all had coated wire tags in them. So we were able to uniquely tag each group with an, um, a, an estuary, a group that was released into the river, a group that was released into the middle estuary, a group that was released in the lower estuary, and a group that didn't have the estuary, we dumped, released them um, um, and discovered passage shut by the bay. So the coated wire tags, as you know, when the, when the coated wire tag is put in, adipose clip is taken off the fish. The back fin is taken off the fish. So those um, adult fish will, would be recovered up to six or eight years later in the uh, fishery or in the hatchery or on the spawning ground. And then we were able to compare how many uh, survived to adulthood uh, of, of the juveniles that were put in certain areas. And uh, it was a, a very um, large experiment because uh, there was about 100,000 fish marked each year. We did it for three years. And um, they were moved by helicopter with a fire bucket and they were flown around uh, each group at the same time, flying around. So even the ones that were released at the, at the hatchery here, where the river released, they were flown around the same time as the ones that uh, were released in the estuary or released in, in uh, the bay. So, and then we had divers in the water trying to see what, uh, what happened to them when they released, whether there was a lot of predators there, whether they were sort of dying instantly or what. Um, but um, it was quite an, an impressive experiment. I certainly have to acknowledge Jim for thanking us. So there is the, the typical, once again, what were we comparing? The river on an estuary on the right and the coastal habitat or high salinity habitat on the right bottom there. And that's our, our sampling crew on the Discovery Passage up by Seymour and Arrows. Uh, so it was um, just comparing the students. Okay, so what happened? Well, we, for one thing, it took us a long time to uh, get all the numbers back. Uh, we got about 1,900 fish back. Uh, the survival was pretty low because these were kind of unusual hatchery fish. They weren't too big and they weren't too, they weren't uh, big enough relative to others. So we were trying to simulate wild fry and of course we couldn't tag wild fry. So we had to go for a sort of compromise, uh, small smolts. Uh, but if we look at the different years, um, 83, 84, 85, river, middle, lower estuary, coastal, and we look at the, uh, the different numbers in the different years, uh, you can see there was quite a, a difference in the survival 
on the, th on the third year. In the third year, it seemed that there was more survival relative to the first two years. Uh, we're not sure why that was. There were changing ocean conditions, there were changing river conditions. Uh, so it's uh, still some unknown factors there. You can see, um, if you look at the PEP experiment overall, uh, the red numbers there um, show there's over 50%, close to 65% of the fish that were exposed to an estuary did survive. So we certainly re uh, had some good evidence there that there was the estuary was improving the survival to adulthood. Uh, when this had really uh, not been done before, all the work uh, in other places had been done just on the, on just on the juveniles. So this is quite good information. <coughs> um, and uh, uh, just, to, just to show, as I come back later in the talk, the, the importance of the river and the ocean can't be uh, discounted in, in all of the estuary estuary work that we do, and this is the kind of experiment that shows that as well. Okay, so uh, what affected the, the survival? I came up with a, a scheme which I call a, an estuary triangle, and there's not only our work, but work from other parts of the world and other uh, areas, and basically showing there's well, it's like a triangle. On one corner is this osmoregulation I was telling you about with the, the change in the blood. And that has to be um, carefully, carefully uh, involved with, with freshwater flow. You don't have enough freshwater flow as we're having some of the creeks on the uh, east coast of the island here with different things happening in, in climate and water withdrawal and so on. We don't have a good mixture of fresh water, then we're going to have problems with the fish going through this tra transformation. Another triangle is the, is I call growth in food. The, the, the diagram on the um, right hand corner is not that clear, but I'll come into it later on. But basically, it's showing that there's certain food in the estuary that is important and it's important for growth. And these are the, the uh, invertebrates that are connected with the marshes, with the riparian vegetation, with the eelgrass, and with the phytoplankton, and there's a certain suite of organisms that um, are involved. And the other, the other, the third corner, I call a habitat um, predation refuge uh, corner. And that is trying to get across the idea that there are certain um, and certain aspects of vegetation that provide cover for these young young fish. Um, we focused on wild chinook. We know that cutthroat trout, for example, are predators on them. And we've done experiments that uh, if we um, uh, can provide a cover for uh, wild wild chinook, they're not they're not preyed on. So it's uh, can also happen with shallow water keeping the refuge the predators out as well. The vegetation is thought to be one of the one of the keys. So this is what I, this is what I call the paradigm for estuary survival. It doesn't matter whether it's a small estuary, like a creek nearby, or a camel, or one of the large ones. These are thought to be the, the basic uh, basic principles. Now we're going to uh, get into some of the management and other aspects uh, in a general way. We know that we've lost uh, different kinds of um, habitat over the years. And, uh, we're doing restoration to try and get them back. Uh, it's not, not only the marshes, but even the shallow water, the grass, gravel beaches in some areas, some species. Um, pollution is another issue. Not such a, possibly such a huge issue here at Campbell River, but in other places, uh, things happening in the fresh water uh, can affect the salmon's uh, ability to go through this, might go through this on the regulation I was talking about. So, <clears throat> for example, if they're have to uh, experience an increase in temperature or some kind of a toxin that's released into fresh water, that will 
uh, impair uh, their ability to change to, um, to salt water. This is there's called a seawater challenge, and people test experiments uh, to look at what happens with uh, estuary uh, water quality and fresh water. <clears throat> Food, as I mentioned, uh, down in the lower left there is the diagram that uh, we actually found first in the Squamish River estuary by John Seiber from the biological station in Imo. I was working with him at the time. <clears throat> and here is showing the, mar the marshy part of the estuary. This is the, the gray part here. That's the, the, the well, what I was calling the middle and lower estuary. And this is the offshore, and you can see amphipods, sedges, algae, these are the sorts of things that are um, detritus, broken down vegetation is keeping those invertebrates going. Offshore, it's more of a phytoplankton uh, food web, and the reason uh, we, John Seibert and others put this diagram together was that at Squamish, they were going to build a major coal port, and that was some of the, some of the work that uh, decided that they probably shouldn't put a coal port there. But kind of interesting, just, just by, by diversion, quite a few years before this, a lady in Russia had come up with the very same type of diagram, and it was just empirical. This is the kind of diagram you get if you put all the different species together. Everything is just all mishmashed together. So they're very complex issues. It was interesting that that was, uh, it wasn't until 72 that we actually found this out in, uh, in North America, but the basic principles were known uh, before uh, elsewhere. Now, the reason I, I mentioned, you, you recall I was talking about the wedge, the salt wedge in the Camel River estuary. <clears throat> now, here we're talking about these kinds of animals here, point and the, the copepods and um, people like uh, Dave Ewer, others, Mr. Downey and others and, and have worked on the plank in here. And this, the Campbell River estuary um, is, has essentially the same type of food web that we're looking at here. But it seems that there's, there's such an exceptionally high production of zooplankton out there, Cape Munch and, and further up. And it, um, when, when the uh, zooplankton is very, very abundant in Discovery Passage, it pushes its way right up in, in, un, under, the, uh, under the fresh water and the salt wedge. So you can, you can take a plankton sample in the bottom, uh, you know, a kilometer upstream from Tidy Spit, and you're getting plankton, which basically is coming out from, uh, from Discovery Passage. So you can see how these, these systems kind of are sliding by one another. And then the young salmon <coughs> are, are also taking advantage of that. Small ones are on the top, large ones are on the bottom. So they, they also feed depending where they find themselves in the water quality. So it's a very interesting, very dynamic, very variable kind of situation in, in the Campbell and, and any estuary with this kind of layering going on and different kinds of food being produced in different parts of the, of the estuary. Um, this is probably, not, as far as you know, not a major issue. Another fact, uh, function, factor that can affect survival are invasive species. Not, uh, as far as I know, not a, a major issue. Invasive fish, fish species are not a major issue here, but they are in some estuaries. Um, for example, just looking at them, the non-Salmon in, in California versus the Fraser River estuary. So this is the Fraser River estuary, and this is the Cal this is the Sacramento, San Joaquin estuary near San Francisco. Here they're, they're off, it's very difficult to find them. A native Salmon in there because they're, 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 they're dominated by things like uh, uh, cyprinas, um, uh, bass, and a whole variety of freshwater species that have been introduced accidentally or purposefully from other parts of the world. And so you can see in the native non Salmonids in Sacramento, way more abundant compared to Fraser, but there's a still a few there too. One of the ones in Fraser we looked at was the brown bullhead. But also the they're invasive um, salmonids as well. We think of them as invasive, they're not native there. 
And that's one, a good example of that is this uh, so-called polytypic brown trout or sea trout native to Europe is no white is no white fit uh, in on every continent except Africa and Antarctica in, in the estuaries. And these are um, brown trout. Um, people from Europe know them very very well. They're, they're they are brown trout in fresh water, but there's a certain group of them that become anadromous, that is, they go to sea, and they're called sea trout. And as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> people from the UK brought them from uh, the UK to New Zealand by steamship in, eight, in 1880, and uh, they're very abundant there now. They're major recreational fisheries. Same thing happened in Chile, Argentina. People fly uh, over from the uh, US to go to Argentina to catch these, these introduced um, brown trout slash sea trout in uh, it's the Rio Grande River in, in Argentina. You can see how big they got. But then there's yet another, and there's the, the, the sort of the normal ones or native ones that are on, on the right hand side there in, in Europe in their natural range. But we even have somewhat of a similar situation here. The, the top one there is called the, the brown trout, and, and they're in the Kalachin and the Adam River. They don't go to they don't they don't go to sea. They just hang out in the real fresh water part in the lower part of the river. And for some reason, whether it's because of the ge genetics behind them or or we don't really know why, no one's ever really looked. But they haven't they haven't spread. Whereas these other places. Um, like in Argentina and um, uh, New Zealand, they have leapfrogged from one stream to another by just using a salty part along, along the coast. That doesn't seem to have happened here. Uh, as far as I know, they haven't spread from the island to Campbell. So if you, if you see a brown trout, sort of like that one in the upper left there, that's, that is a brown trout. They're very, they're very distinctive, they are brown. Uh, and we'd be very anxious to see if anybody's catching them in the gambles. They were, as I say, they were introduced in the college in, in the um, early part, 1920 or so. And apparently somebody found them in the, in the Gold Stream uh, a few years later. But they, they hadn't spread into the Gold Stream in a big way at all, or anything in the other rivers in the east coast of the island too. So there's a lot of interesting things going on with these. You don't often think of the invasion because people um, catch them. They like, they like fishing for them. So then, uh, once again, look, looking further down the food level of the invasive, invasive species, um, as I mentioned, the sedges are important for uh, feeding broken down vegetation into the invertebrates. Uh, some of the other uh, invasive plants could be an issue of need looking at. And, uh, for, I know I think there's uh, issues here with blackberries and other uh, common plants. One of, the, one of the obvious ones you had in the lower Fraser was this purple purple loosestrife, and it, it was found to uh, feed its way into the uh, food web at a different time of the year relative to natural sedges. So. Or what, we don't know what happened when the, these food webs are switched out. And finally, the lot, one of the last remaining uh, aspects of, of survival, of course, is ourselves. I didn't, you know, I've been focusing on juveniles, but uh, we, we're catching the adults ourselves, as, as you know. The First Nations were using weirs, of course, and that probably was a more substantial or sustainable way of doing it. We have the same boats and recreational fishing even in, in, in uh, Bakey Slough. So we have to keep that in mind. There's the mortality of the adults in the estuary occurring to, to ourselves as well. Uh, I think I'm getting pretty close to running out here. Uh, um, just to, I've already mentioned the fact that the, the salmon are moving around as the temperature warms. Just another local issue that uh, might be interesting or important is that with the warming of the climate and the melt melting of, of the glaciers, many of these species are adapted to cold systems. And then there's a, 
that it's a Japanese species, but it's very similar to Dolly Varden or Voltro. Uh, I'm sure you, you, they were uh, in Hanasco up in Dunedin, not Campbell. But declining ducks, um, the flow was could have a, 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 an influence on those as well. So over and above all these sort of local estuary uh, phenomena is the climate change issue. Okay, so just winding up, as I mentioned, other things that we don't know we don't know a lot about. I, we have, we've, Campbell River is one of the more intensively studied estuaries. Nanaimo is another one, Fraser. But there's lots of other estuaries that have, we don't know much about. Manasco is one of them. And there are other different aspects of them that uh, we need to know about. The beaches themselves, the huge issue of Puget Sound because young salmon are moving along the beaches here. I didn't get into that at all, but in our, in our sampling in Discovery Passage, we know that there are huge numbers of chum, sockeye, all the species uh, from the Fraser River, for example, except those going through Juan de Fuca. They have to get out to the sea through Discovery Passage. So they're all, they're smolted up. They're, they've done their estuary thing in the Fraser River. By the time they get here, <coughs> they're more interested in getting to sea and moving along the beaches. So if the beaches are, um, if they're relying on food on the beaches, and the beaches are changing, that's another issue. And Puget Sound is spending literally millions of dollars trying to fix up their beaches because they've changed them with uh, beach structures, riprap, putting out groins, and so on. And the sand supply, gravel supply to the beaches is not happening. Um, uh, I think Goosebeck uh, Comox is probably a, a local example. And of course we have this, the smelt on the beaches and the kelp beds and the rocky walls. These are kinds of things that we don't know much about. Like I said, we emphasize a lot of work on the sort of muddy, marshy places which are the sort of classical estuaries, but there's other kinds of estuaries that we don't know too much about. Uh, just wrap winding up, I think, is the important message is that I've tried to emphasize that the estuary is, is, is not like a, a magic silver bullet. You have to realize that it's connected with the river and, and with the ocean. And so the, they're, they're linked systems and you have to somehow maintain the, uh, the linkages uh, between all those three in order to have a good survival of the salmon. So, um, there's a complex life histories and a lot of ecological processes involved, but the bottom line is that we do need all of those three uh, major ecosystems to uh, maintain our, our salmon. And that's a, uh, I've specialized in one, one pocket of it, but there's more to it. Finally, I have acknowledgements. I've, uh, I've been in uh, doing the work for quite a number of years, and certainly, uh, as I mentioned over the over during the talk, Jim helped a lot with the Campbell River experiment, and a huge investment in time and, and effort and money to, to raise those fish. Uh, UBC and Iris, uh, that's a, a group I belong to there for the permanent line uh, online appendices, which I couldn't have done if I hadn't been had an affiliation at UBC. I'm not an UBC employee, I'm just a, a freeloader free there, to, so to speak, with them. And uh, also at the Pacific Salmon Foundation, who enabled the printing of, of the book. And to the reviewers, readers, editors, and my wife for tolerating hours of rewrite in my home office, because while well, I do have an office in uh, a VFO lab, uh, just a, a few kilometers away from uh, from my home, so I, I did a lot of writing in my office and I hunkered down there with, uh, with all the references. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, appreciate the invitation to coming in. <laughs>